Hi, I'm Susan and welcome to Susan Stanley Stitch in Time. On this channel, I usually talk about cross stitch, quilting, textiles, sewing notions and sewing methods from the past and I share my projects with you. Um, for those of you who have been following me, you know that I've been working on a new project for this year and so we're going to start diving into that today. We're also going to look at what I've been working on. We're going to have an update on work baskets. Of course, we're going to look at 1870. That's kind of my focus for this year in all things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to take a peek at this quilt and I'm going to give you a shop update at the end. So thank you again to all of you who watch. Thank you so much for the new subscribers. I've reached a new uh, landmark here and I thank you so much for those of you who have been here from the beginning. You are my champions and I thank you. And I'm just delighted at all the new people who are joining. Um, there are new people joining the Mary 1840 project and there are just new people joining the channel who are interested in these discussions. So I, I thank you really again for taking the time out of your day or while you're stitching to um, listen and stitch along with me. We've reached 6,000 subscribers, so next episode is going to be a really huge subs uh, celebration because not only have we've reached that landmark, it will be my three year floss tube anniversary and my one year launch of the first stitches projects. So I have something really wonderful that I've been working on and I, I'm going to share with you. I've, I have many exciting things to share with you over the course of this year. But this item is something that will kind of be uh, an anniversary celebration. Uh, anyway, please, please come back next episode. Uh, I'm just delighted and I, uh, you'll know, you'll find out more. I'm going to save it for next episode, but um, I just thank you again for being a part of this experience for, and, and I love sharing it with you and I love hearing from you. So there will be lots of opportunities for giveaways next time. We're just going to make party it up big. So if you want to receive notifications about the videos, please ring the bell. And then also I want to encourage you again to sign up for the newsletter. Other communications will come to you through the newsletter and you won't want to miss this. I'm going to be making you aware of new products and new programs that I have and new classes that I have coming. And the sign up is on my website and I'm going to link, I'm going to, I'm going to scroll that below, but I'm also going to link it below. If you go to my website, www.susanstandley. There's a D in my last name. If you don't get the D, you won't find my website. Stitchintime.com. So here it is. Okay, and you want to go to the contact section on my website, and you don't want to just contact me. You want to sign up for the newsletter. You want to click the newsletter box and sign up for the newsletter. And I'm going to show you a photo here of what that looks like. All right, so make sure you're signing up for the newsletter. It's not the same as sending me a message. I'm trying to reconcile some of the people who've sent me a message and haven't signed up for the newsletter and make sure you're, um, you are signed up. And if you, if you have any doubt, just sign up again. It's fine. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your lovely comments about meeting my mom. I'm so happy I was able to share her with you on episode 43 on the last episode. And I was really, I was really excited to get her first stitches story. I didn't know some of that that she that she shared with all of us. So uh, it was special, and you know that's that's why I'm always encouraging everyone to document your work, write down what was happening, write down your feelings, write down your memories. Because to me, the work itself is precious, but the stories behind the work are just even bump it up to a next level. So I hope that encourages you to share your first stitches stories with me. I've 
there are new people f finishing their, their doll quilt tops, there are new people starting, there are some people who have completely finished and some of you thinking about it. So dive in, it's, it's really fun. If you go to the hashtag first underscore stitches, you can see people's progress and uh, he, look at, you know, if you want to look at their stories and how, how they're feeling about it. But I think most people are kind of amazed and uh, delighted at the same time. So um, my mom sent me an update on her projects that she was working on. If you watched episode 43, you'll know what I'm talking about. She shared her her photo of uh, a photo of her firecracker tree. If you remember, her tree was just in the works. I'm going to insert a picture right here of where she is now with it. She's creating her own cross stitch, and uh, this is her tree. So let me pop that in. I thought that was wonderful and I also have uh, a message that she sent for me to share with you that I'm going to read. So she says her tree is on eight of cloth and it was designed and stitched by her and she calls her work many stitches. They do not all make an X but the end product is okay with me says my mom. I would like to be a perfectionist, but many years of stitching, you find out about yourself things that you can't let bother you. And if you're doing your hobby and accept yourself as you are, I, she, I said, she says, I found out I was not in that class. Just keep stitching and enjoy your talent. So basically she's just saying, don't worry about being perfect. Do what you love, stitch what you love. Um, and she wanted me to share that with you. So thanks, Mom. Last time we met, we, we on the last episode, I shared with you Corliss and Faraby. I had someone message me and say they have an ancestor by the name of Faraby. It's a very unusual old name, and so I was delighted to hear about that. She said, her Faraby is not related to my Faraby. Now you know my Faraby is a is a not is a fictional character, right? These these two girls are anonymous in real life, but uh, Faraby in my story is from 1870 Kentucky, and her her family has different roots. But I thought that was so interesting because it is a very unique name and and not very often heard. Uh, I'm excited about your response. I know it's going to be an excellent year. And like I said, there are still people joining last year's project, Mary 1840. You're more than welcome to join that. I still have kits and I, all the videos for that. If you're just starting patchwork or you want to help someone who's just starting patchwork, all the video tutorials are free and available on my website. I'm sorry that up on my YouTube channel playlist so you can go look at the history of the project you can look at the tutorials you can look at the floss tube episodes that talk about it all of it's right there for you in one little nice tidy little package so uh, I thought it was really fun as I was diving into learning about what stitching was like for girls in 1870 to realize that Mary from 1840 at that time would have been about 30 Five years old. I crafted her to be a five-year-old. Uh, these girls are a little bit older, but Mary, by the time these girls were of her age, Mary would have been 35. So just kind of fun. You know, it's, it's an interesting way to kind of get a feeling for what life was like, even though they're fictional. And why am I creating fictional characters? Because typically children's stories in their stitches were not written down. We, we say women's stories weren't written down. Well, women did write their stories down when they were older, and sometimes they did refer to their childhood. And that's how we know a little bit about how children learned. Uh, we know from other sources as well, but there really just isn't a whole lot out there. So um, from what I know, what adults have said in their diaries later in their life about how they learned, that's how I've crafted crafted this experience. So I hope you'll join me. Uh, I think it's going to be really fun. 
so since I saw you last, I, I've had a few things that I've focused on. And one of them was the nine patch challenge by Repro Quilt Lover on Instagram. And I'm going to scroll that below right here. It's at Repro Quilt Lover. If you're interested in joining last episode 43, I talked you through how you can create this project using the tutorials from Mary 1840 and just adapting them slightly. Um, so yeah, you have skills now. You can, you can actually do this patchwork. Um, I'm, I chose to do mine, I'm going to do mine all in indigo. So I just added a few blocks to my collection and I'm keeping them in this tin cookie jar, <laughs> tin cookie canister. And you know, as I have time, I just put a few together. They're scrappy indigos. I have the negative and the positive blocks, meaning some corners are light and some corners are dark outer corners and you know I'm just gonna keep going as far as I can I'm not doing the scrappy I'm not copying her antique as closely as I can I'm re I've reinterpreted it in my own way with indigos so that's one thing I've been working on pardon me here um, the next thing I worked on was uh, some a project from sampler symposium and I attended that in early January and Grace Paisley Stitcher and I uh, as you know if you've watched me um, talk about that experience drove from San Diego to the attic together and it's just been so great getting to know Grace over the years uh, going to these events but we took an optional class which was with Ma with Mary Cox and it was a project based on this gorgeous box that she had commissioned um, by Liberty Hill and it's you're going to create your own sewing box for girls and so we we both really a young lady's work box now I don't believe Mary does not sell her patterns they are her projects are available through workshops and guild events and that's that's as much as I know and if I'm if I'm wrong, correct me. But uh, you know, if you want to specifically do this project, I'm not sure you're just gonna have to look for events where she's teaching it. But I wanted to share it with you because I decided this last few weeks, I really want to conquer over one. I wanna feel really confident about over one. And Jean from The Attic has talked about stitching over one in her videos. And this section here, this little tray that goes into the main cavity of the the work box all the wording actually the whole thing is stitched over one and so grace and i decided we we have a lot of projects going on it's easy to let these beautiful things languish so our challenge was this month we need to get all the wording done for this this section so i'm getting close i didn't complete it but i did i did get this far and what I wanted to tell you, um, Mary has the project charted, or she recommends in the project that you just stitch a tent stitch. Jean had talked about that as well. And when you're looking at it closely and you see one linen thread that's not covered, it kind of jangles you a tiny bit. But honestly, from afar or just from regular viewing point, unless I've got my magnifying glasses on and I'm looking really close, it looks great. Um, actually, I should put it here. So I'm pleased that, I, that I'm sticking with this. Uh, it's gonna be gorgeous when it's done. It'll just be a fun little, a fun memory of like time gathered with friends and as you can see I mean I do like these rich colors kind of kind of goes with my aesthetic in my home and uh, anyway so I worked on that over one was my was my challenge to myself and then I worked on the thing that I just cannot put down which I know if you've been following me you know uh, and I think other people are getting sucked into this as well. The needlework panel of a fruit tree with two animals by the Scarlet Letter from 1690. 
And I'm, I'm mentioning that date because, let me show you my progress, first of all. Now this chart, initially I looked at it, oh, it's gorgeous, you know, I'm just, it'll be all that full coverage. I've never done a full coverage piece. I wanna try that. And then I got the chart, I dove right in, and this whole, you know, main sections here on the bottom are all over one. And I chose to do, I'm using a Vera Soie and uh, Corkscrew Willow linen. Now here's the threads. And here is my progress. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a, yes, it's a Vera Soie Soie Del Jay. I'm sorry if I didn't say that. I, I get kind of, you know, I get kind of hyped up and then I forget to say things. <laughs> So here I am, here's how far I've gotten, and I, my goal was to really tackle the over one. I really wanted to feel confident. Kim, Contented Needleworker Kim is working on it. If you go look at her um, Instagram, you can see her progress. Her tent stitch for the over one is gorgeous. Uh, there's also someone who has reached out to me that I'm going to talk about quite a bit, Louise Edmonds. And she is on Instagram as well. And I'm, I will scroll her Instagram name below. I'm sorry. I um, I, you know, I was doing the over one. I wasn't really super happy with it. And so of course then I ran up here and started doing the part that I love. And in the meantime, I'm going to talk about these fruit because I went down kind of a rabbit hole with the fruit. But let me tell you about my over one experience. So I started doing over one full crosses with the Avera Soie Soie d'Alger on this 37 count corkscrew willow. And the first row looked great. And then I went to put the next row in and I went, oh, this is super tight. This is not going to, this is going to be hard. I mean, it's, I want, I want to feel confident and I don't want to run away from it. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to do the tent stitch. Kim did the tent stitch. She, she suggested that when we were at Sampler Symposium. I thought I can do that. I, I did the Mary project. I started doing the tent stitch. I don't know what it was, if it was like my visual tracking or something. I was having such a hard time determining where the cross was because it wasn't making a letter, it was making a design and it was kind of going all over. And so that was kind of giving me trouble. So I don't know if you can see, but there is one kind of tealy green line that's the full cross in the Soie d'Alger. And then there's a line next to it in uh, a different color in the black that's a tent stitch. And then I thought, because Jean had mentioned it, why don't I just pull out my Soie Surfine? Uh, I've been collecting that. I've been, you know, encouraging people to use it for patchwork. And, uh, and I know people use it all the time for cross stitch. And so I started doing full crosses with Swasserfine. And I don't know if you can see this section right here that's supposed to be for the tail. That, it, that black is Swasserfine. And I'm actually happy with that. So that's, that's what I think I'm going to complete this with. And I do have amazingly enough of the colors to do the animal in my in my collection upstairs, and then I can adapt the colors, I think, to make them pleasing for the foliage, the flower, and the other bush. So that's what I'm doing. Those of you who are working on this project or have done a full coverage piece with combined over one and and full crosses, I would love to hear from you and how you tackled it. I thought 37 count would give me plenty of room, but it's amazing how that thread really puffs out and fills in, and I don't want to split threads. I don't want to split linens. I want to keep it. Now, I am using uh, a beading needle for the Swasserfine 
um, and a 28 for the Avera Soie Soie d'Alger, and that, that's made a big difference too. So, last time I said, okay, I'm, I love this, I love the colors, I'm completely sucked in to the colors on this. They are just, they are, they are my colors, they're my happy colors. Uh, you know, I like to know a little bit about a piece. I like to know if it's someone that we can research and know who stitched it. I'd love to, I love to know that. I love to know the why of things. And so this was stitched originally around 1690. It says circa 1690. And uh, it has some history on, on the chart that I'll, I'll leave you to read if you decide to purchase it. Uh, very interesting research that the Scarlet Letter has done. I wanted to know, she, you know, she tells you what the animals are, apparently, but the fruit to me was not obvious. And, you know, initially I thought, well, it's got, it must be apples, you know, and then I looked and I thought, I have an apple tree, and they don't hang in clusters with long stems like that off my apple tree. They also, I think these varied colors represent, I thought, well, maybe that represents the shine on the fruit. Now, bear with me because I love going down these rabbit holes and I love, I love trying to figure things out. Um, so I reached, I said, I asked you, I asked you all last time, what do you think it is? And, you know, I, I got a variety of responses. Here are some of the things I considered that it might be. I can, of course, I considered it might be an apple, and apples are, you know, I wasn't just looking at what they looked like, I was looking at what would have meant something in 1690 to the person stitching this. Why would they have maybe chosen that fruit tree to, to represent? So, an apple is, is considered a gift and a declaration of love. It's also, uh, of course, mean, can also be representative of evil and associated with Adam and Eve in the biblical story. And an apple in a serpent's mouth represents original sin. Well, there's no serpent here, thankfully, because I really don't like snakes. Um, anyway, so, you know, I couldn't really definitively say that that was an apple and that had huge meaning. You know, honestly, I'll tell you right now from the start, I went through all these different options of what this could be, and I couldn't really come up with a strong conclusion, but it was just a lot of fun. And I would love to know if you come up, if you think you have determined what this is. Anyway, so then I thought, well, perhaps it's a fig. It has kind of that, you know, what are they trying to represent there with that shading and shadowing and... So I, I looked up, were figs even in England in that time? And yes, they were. They were thought to have been brought over in, the, in about 1100 um, by the Romans. Now, this is just super cursory research and information, so I might find more later. I, I'm not making a definitive statement on any of this. Maybe it was fig. Here's a picture of a fig. All right, then I thought, well, you know, the way they cluster and hang, maybe it's cherries. All right, so I live in Washington State. There's Mount Rainier cherries, Rainier cherries here. Here's a picture of Rainier cherries. I thought, well, maybe that's what is being represented, represented in this coloration. Uh, I thought per perhaps, you know, what I'd like it to be, I'd really like it to be a pomegranate. I mean, I would be happy if it was pomegranate. I love pomegranates. I love the way they, I love what they represent. They re represent abundance, proster prosperity, and hope of eternal life. They are the symbol of Spain. They were also uh, featured prominently during the reign of King Henry VIII of England as he was married to Catherine Aragon. I am looking at some of this information from this book, if you're interested. 
Sampler Motifs and Symbolism by Patrick Andrell and Leslie Rudnicki. So perhaps it's a pomegranate. Um, I don't know. Now I did grow up with a pomegranate tree in my backyard and the foliage looks like it could be. Here's a, here's a picture. But I don't know. The way they're hanging is suspicious. And then, and then, I received a comment from Louise Edmonds, and she agreed to let me share this with you. And she is also stitching this piece, and you should definitely go look at it. It's beautiful. Her start is beautiful. And she wanted to share with me some of the information that I shared with you. And she, she has decided she wants hers to be the, represented as a pomegranate. And I think that's the bottom line in all this is you can let it be represented as whatever you want. But uh, she said, and then she was hoping so much it wasn't the dreaded meddler tree. And I said, what in the world is a meddler tree? I'd never heard of it. Now, meddler trees, I'm going to put a picture in right here of the fruit. That little burst on the bottom, that little kind of four star burst or five star burst on the bottom of the fruit looks suspiciously like the picture. And I thought, that's interesting. Why have I never heard of this tree? It's a lot like a kumquat or a loquat. And it's mostly in the south southeastern states. It grows, but not even very well there. It's not really in this on this continent so much. So it made me feel a tiny bit better. But this tree has some very interesting significance from this time period. William Shakespeare referred to it, and not in complimentary ways. It has a very tawdry uh, meaning, significance. It's, it's referred to in not such appealing ways. And I'm going to link below where you can read all about it and find out more if you're interested. I'm not gonna share it right here, but I thought, you know, it's something that you would let almost rot before you ate. If you ate it too early, it would cause huge stomach problems. I, I don't know. I'm very suspicious. Anyway, I'd love to know what you think. And it's just been fun researching this and kind of coming up with some ideas. There are so many ancient fruits and vegetables and grains and things that we don't even know existed. Uh, this meddler tree is referred to in William Shakespeare's literature, as I might have mentioned. And uh, everything we, we know now has been so homogenized. And so I, find, I found that really fun, just to dive in and learn a little bit more. And it's made stitching the piece all the more interesting. So please weigh in if you have any ideas or comments. And if you're starting it, I want to hear from you. So as you know, as we've been exploring the 1800s and sewing and stitching and all the things including involving needle and thread, we've talked about, or I've talked about, work baskets and the contents. And last time I started talking to you a little bit about scissors and the necessity of having different scissors for different functions and that scissors were crafted for different functions and uh, you know the shape of the scissors, the materials used, the way they were forged, they were all crafted and for specific use. And we talked um, about things being hand forged by a blacksmith. It would have to be someone with incredible skill. We, were ta we talked about uh, drop forged, where they were basically cut out like a cookie cutter. And then uh, there are stamped scissors. And here's an example of a stamped scissor. And I bet every one of you has one of these in your house. And these are not intended for fabric. Although you probably can cut with cut fabric with them, I reserve mine for paper, 
and maybe opening packaging. Um, why do I do that? Because of the way different materials, meaning fabric, paper, cardboard, change the way the blades are set and change the need for how they're sharpened, the way they're sharpened. So some of the materials that were used in early scissors and in scissors today were steel and iron and on the blades and gold, silver, and pearl for the bow. And so, you know, the blade and then these are the bow, we call them, call them the handles. And this week, I thought it was so fun because this week I got the, my Quilt Mini magazine. Now, if, you, if you're a quilter, you will probably be familiar with it. And if you're not, you might want to familiarize yourself with it. It's uh, a French magazine. It's international. It has a little bit of every flavor in it. Uh, there's usually historic information in there, which of course is why I love it. And lots of inspiration. They go into people's homes and share photos of their collections and whatnot. One of the articles though this month was so fun. It was superstitions in stitching or in quilt, in quilting, but it applies to everything. And there's all these superstitions around scissors. And, you know, people in earlier times were, I guess they were plagued with superstitions, but not, you know, I can't really cast judgment because that was how they explained their natural world. They didn't have a way of understanding it. And so that's, um, that's what made sense to them, or it was a way to, to understand life, really, to explain the unknown. And the, as we've progressed and become aware of scientific reasons for things, we've still retained a lot of these superstitious mythology, folklore type beliefs. And it's just interesting how they pervade pervade our culture anyway. So I need, I really wanted to read a couple of these because scissors were mentioned quite a bit. It says, leaving scissors with the blades open is bad luck. Well, it's also kind of dangerous. So to leave scissors open while sewing is an indication that you will be disappointed in the completed item. So, you know, this must have been a way to get, you know, how many times did you tell your kids, close your scissors, carry them by the handle, you know, to sit on a pair of scissors is a bad omen. I thought it was great. Uh, there's, there's also a whole bunch of things um, about pins and needles. And uh, anyway, it was just fun. And I kind of thought it kind of tied into what we were talking about. If you lay your scissors on your quilt while quilting, Stitch around them to keep bad luck trapped. It's just so curious to me. Anyway, I want to share that with you because likely the people, the, the work baskets were filled with these with items like scissors and the people using them were filled with these notions. And this was part of the material culture that I talked about what was going on while these little girls were learning to stitch. I'll probably talk a little more about this in the future, but it is really important the way you care for your scissors. And uh, for sure, if you ever have really nice quality scissors sharpened, you wanna have a really reputable scissor sharpener do that. And uh, they're becoming harder and harder to find in, in my neck of the woods, that's for sure. So, um, many of you have commented on the scissors that you have from a relative, even though they don't work, uh, which is, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. They don't work. I haven't had them brought up to work functional status. I keep them because it was a common object that somebody I loved or somebody in my past used, and somehow that f makes me feel connected to them. Um, I guess we all share that somehow I can think about them doing their work while I do mine. 
So this year my focus is on stitching and textiles and what was going on in America in the 1870s and beyond. It's, it really, you really just have to look at kind of globally what was going on. But let's begin our adventure by looking at what was happening specifically in sewing circles and quilting bees. Sewing circles and quilting bees were really, really popular and prevalent and necessary for social interaction during the 1870s. And, you know, most people, we, we don't realize it, maybe we feel that way a little bit. We're, we're kind of isolated in their own, in their own home, on their own farm, working really hard. And the time of, you know, interaction, it just, there just wasn't time for it. And if it, if there was time, it, it had to be centered around a useful purpose in many ways. So, I mean, we all feel like that, and I know we did during the lockdown, which we hardly remember anymore, but we kind of do. Um, and I think that's why we connect on Floss too, because we just we all crave that interaction and that time to to stitch together. And so they, it was kind of like a retreat you know, when they got together and it was to finish a project and they were celebrating sewing. They, uh, it was mostly an event for women. When women would come for the day, they would bring their children. The ones, some were relegated to the cooking and they would prepare a huge feast and the rest of them would sit around the sewing circle or the quilt frame and quilt up to seven quilts a day, I've heard, which is incredible if you think about it. All these hands busily working uh, to get those stitches in, to get that quilt top quilted and ready for use. And then at the end of the day, the rest of the family would gather, the husbands would come in, and everyone would have a huge feast. I mean, it sounds really fun. It sounds like a lot of work, but it also sounds like a way to, to get the job done when you needed to, to have a quilt quilted. I've quilted some of my own quilts and it's taken me years and I don't even have to work a farm. So, <laughs> um, there was other time, there were other times for stitching in proper company when you were visiting someone, uh, and you were doing fancy work and other finer needlework on clothing items and stitchery and whatnot. But, uh, during 1870, even though a sewing machine was available for domestic use, it wasn't in everybody's hands yet. And then we'll talk more about how that happened over time. But they were becoming they were becoming more popular. But women just gathered to complete their household quilts and create quilts of friendship as people moved and they would help someone start their bridal quilt and their collection of quilts for their lifetime that they would keep. Uh, and they met in churches and community centers, and um, there were benevolent societies established, and all kinds of things happening, all centered around stitching and sewing and quilting and all the needle arts that we love. And I want to read you a quote out of a journal. It's a diary of a woman named Carolyn Richards. She was 17, and she wrote this in 1859. And she says, the young ladies have started a society. We are to meet in two weeks and are to present each member with an album bed quilt with all our names on when they are married. And so here's an example of what I was talking about of someone sharing their story. She was 17. She wasn't five doing her very first quilt, but she's, she's um, you know, sharing her experience. It was a time to work and learn new skills and socialize with each other. And we're going to talk a lot more about that and some of the societies that were born out of that and what they did on a national scale um, through their stitching. Now, I also want to share with you a quilt that the quilt that's behind me. I'm going to pop a picture in here of the entire thing because you're just seeing a small section of it. It just expands out from here. Uh, so here's the picture of the whole quilt.
This quilt is called Western Sun, and it's it's very, very special to me. It was um, a box of blocks and pieces of flying geese units, and a flying goose unit is this, this right here. Kind of looks like a bird. This is the sky, the darker, and the bird is the light triangle. And that's a unit that's used in a lot of quilts and, and we will talk about more and I'll actually probably show you how to do that someday if you don't know already. Um, and so I received this as these units, these pieces as a gift when I was moving from Texas to Washington State. And I, I think it's perfect because I was leaving a really sunny area. I'd lived in San Diego and Arizona and Texas and it was full of sunshine and heat and I was moving to this place that was a really different climate for me. I had no idea how different it was going to be and feel but I think it was just perfect, perfect block. And uh, so I took those pieces which were lovingly crafted by my friends um, and finished them and completed them into blocks and put the whole quilt together and in the seam of every block I wrote the person's name so that when this decomposes or if anyone ever if anything ever happens with it at some point when it's falling apart you'll see people's names um, the people who meant so much to me in my time there I, I spent the next year adding blocks and putting more together now this block is pieced this background section is pieced and the circle is appliqued on. So I did applique most of the circles. Most of the people didn't want to do that. And so I, I appliqued them. Um, it's from a book. It's been, it's a, well, it's actually an antique quilt. It's a quilt that was owned by a woman named Julie Silber. And it's a quilt by, by a woman named Mary Strickler. And I'm going to put a picture of it in here. This is the only picture of the antique I could find. So I'm going to put that in right here. So Barbara Brackman took that. I don't know if she had seen the whole quilt. I don't really know the whole history. It's not in the book. But she took that and drafted it out in this book and reinterpreted it in kind of these golds as the theme of her book was butternut and blue and it's a it's a it is a quilt from the civil war era it was not created during the civil war but it was from that era uh, i love this quilt so much mostly because of the meaning behind it but this quilt is full of scraps and i mean old and new and everything you can imagine and the the dominant color theme is matter and matter is a dye that came from a plant called the matter plant the root and it typically would give you this kind of uh, we would probably today call it rust a rusty color but it also gave you some purple tone purple shades you could also dye it and use uh, kind of a peachy pink would come from it some browns it was a stable dye. It was easy to set with the Morden. It was lasting, and so it was used quite a bit during the, that later 1800s time period and, and before. But uh, anyway, it warms my heart. It makes me think of my friends, and uh, it's, it's just so happy when I pull it out. And when you move from the southern states to the Pacific Northwest, um, you want to keep a little bit of that warm sunshine and with you as as you go and so it warms my heart and makes me think of my friends last of all uh, the shop update I want to remind you again to please sign up for the newsletter if you'd like first notice of things coming up uh, I have sent out all of the back ordered peaceful partridge mini sewing baskets uh, I did have some extra that people were on a wait list for, and I believe everyone's been notified for that. 
If you're interested, please sign up for the newsletter. If there's any extra beyond that, I'll, let, I'll be letting people know on the newsletter. And if there's a lot more interest, I, I'm willing to do another batch, but um, you know, I need to hear from you. So wanted to let everybody know you should have be receiving them about now because they went out early this week. There are some new items coming soon, like I said. Uh, something very special next week, next uh, episode that I, I really, I'm just delighted to be able to share with you. And uh, projects, classes, things that I have planned. So please, um, please come back. Next time I'll share more on my projects and more on that fruit. Uh, I, I'm not done uncovering what that might be and learning more about where, you know, where the roots of all that uh, knowledge comes from. I'll share more 1870 updates. We're going to celebrate big time all these things I have coming up. And uh, until then, make time for stitching.